Welcome to How It Works. On today's episode, a demonstration of FileRead, a product that brings a suite of generative AI capabilities to the e-discovery platform, Relativity. Joining me today to tell us all about it and show us how it works is Justin Brownstone, Strategic Partnership Lead at FileRead. Justin, welcome to How It Works. Thanks for having me, Bob. Well, before we get into the demo, take a second to tell us a little bit about FileRead and what you do. Sure, thank you. So FileRead, as you said, is a relativity application. For the time being, we exist solely as an application within relativity. We allow users to ask natural language questions of their relativity documents and generate work product that in turn cites to those documents. So you can ask FileRead for chronologies, fact memos, and we'll show our work. In other words, you can see all the documents supported in those memos and chronologies that FileRead generates. And when you say for the time being, you mean there's going to be a standalone application at some point? Yeah, hopefully in a couple of weeks, actually. But we wanted to get this rolling with you, show our relativity application. But we've had a lot of inbound interest for a standalone application outside relativity. It won't be, I want to be very clear, an e-discovery platform. It'll be the ability to do the type of Q&A natural language queries that I'll show in a moment but across your own documents and across large quantities of documents. So we feel our real, one of our differentiators is that it's accurate over hundreds of thousands or millions of documents. And our users want that ability outside relativity. All right, well, I'm sure people are curious to see how it looks. So why don't we jump right into it? Let's uh, take a look at how it works. Great, I'll share my screen. Okay, so we're looking at a couple of work sites within relativity, rel one right now. And I'm going to use this McKenzie opioid worksite right now, where we've put over uh, 105,000 documents from the McKinsey opioid litigation. So we've been doing Enron for 15 years now in legal tech. We thought we'd throw something else in. That's why we're using McKinsey opioid. Everybody but if people want Enron, that. we could do that too. So all these icons here, this is all relativity if you want to click and review documents. But if you have access to file read, you get this button here, and now we're inside FileRead, which exists within Relativity. So as I mentioned, what FileRead allows you to do is ask natural language questions of the documents and generate work product like fact memos. So, for example, to demonstrate the fact memo capability, I have here a question where I asked, create a fact memo about the key executives at Purdue. And now it's running over those 100,000 plus documents. And we get back to a summary, which describes John Stewart, who had multiple roles, including chief executive officer, Michael Friedman, and it goes on, Ed Mahoney, Bill Mallon. And for each of these, we can see there's a site, and that's probably small on your screen, but that's a letter. And when I click that site, I then open up the underlying document or documents that are being relied upon in that fact memo. So if I then click on that icon, it takes me back into relativity where I can see the actual document that's being relied on. And in fact, I can open up this panel here. And if I click on it, it'll take me to the key point within the document that file reads is relying on to draft that memo. So maybe within a two page email, not necessary, but you know, if you've got a 28 page document, very helpful to go into that document and see the key part that FileRead is utilizing to draft the memo. Any questions about the fact memo capability before I go on? You may have said this if I, if I missed it, but if you're querying against a set of documents, are you able to kind of put any kind of parameters around which documents, like maybe you don't want all the documents or a date range or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. There are multiple ways to decide which documents you're querying against. And that leads into what I want to talk about next, which is how Perfect. you do that. So okay. you can see there are these inside topics. And I started with our default topic, which includes the full approximately 105,000 documents. There's a couple exceptions there, which we'll get to. But you can also, when you create this topic, select a subset of documents. So to do that, when I create an inside topic, I can give it a name. I can decide whether it's public or private, meaning just within my team. We follow Relativity's security permissions. And then I can either link to the entire file read index, all the documents that we've indexed in from the worksite, or any saved search within Relativity. So for example, I could select just the depositions that have been taken in the case. And in fact, that's what I did here. I created a topic that just included 
documents from depositions. So if you scroll up here, I then just started asking questions about this subset of documents, which is again, only the depositions, not the full 105,000. Asked just to start off, identify the people being deposed in these depositions. And I can get that list. And then I said, give me a short summary of the topics discussed. And I learned, this is, I was investigating myself actually, trying to figure out what's going on in this case. And it turns out that these suspicious order monitoring practices are very important. But I could pick a single depot and say, create a fact memo about the deposition of Stephen Becker. And then I get a depot summary where, again, it's going to cite to the key parts of the document. But in this case, it's going to be the actual deposition itself. I and mean, you can kind of see here, I won't go back into the, uh, the documents, but you get the idea. It's linking to the underlying deposition uh, of just Stephen Becker. There are other ways to slice and dice it, um, but that's the basic idea. So before you saw about 105,000, but again, this topic includes just 87 documents, depositions, deposition notices, and exhibits. Does that answer your, your question? That answers my question perfectly. Thank you. Oh, great. There's, there's some other ways to slice and dice it. Um, you wouldn't use this here, but if we go back to the default topic where we've got that 105,000, I can use any metadata field to include or exclude, but this would be something more likely to use in an actual case. We downloaded PDFs off the internet. There's not as much useful metadata like you would have in an actual collection. So to explain either when you're creating an inside topic, you can select a relativity safe search. That's what I tend to do. I find it easier. But within any inside topic, you could also narrow down and say, no, I just want to ask about these dates or this custodian. So two different main ways to ask questions about a subset of documents. All right. So I think that covers uh, the fact memo functionality. Now I'll go through the chronology functionality. So I could also say, instead of asking for a fact memo, if I just want the tool to generate a chronology of key documents, I can say, create a chronology about how the marketing of opioids evolved over time. And it comes back and it says 1980s, 1987, early 1990s, Purdue Pharma starts developing a time release formulation, um, on and on. I get these key dates and again, we're citing to the underlying documents for each of these. So often a project in a case where you've got you know, 100,000 documents is figuring out how to get them into chronological order, how to find the key documents. We can do that in a matter of minutes by just asking for a chronology. So how, how do I ask questions? How do I do that? We do it here uh, where it says ask a question. So we've got two pre-built suggestions formatting of questions and responses here, which I've demoed for you, create a fact memo about or create a chronology about, and that returns questions in the format you saw. But what's key here is that you can also ask questions in, in any format. And you'll get a shorter response, but you could ask something very specific, like, is there any document that says ABC? So really quickly now, I'll just touch on that idea of we can go very broad or very specific with the tool. So if I'm preparing for a deposition, I might say, create a fact memo about this McKinsey partner's role and responsibilities. I want key documents related to a particular person. And here we've got this partner I've cherry picked, we'll see, from McKinsey, and it talks about his formal role, his work, again, signing to all the documents. But I could ask, also ask a question like, are there any documents that contradict his claim made a deposition that he had no knowledge regarding deletion of documents. So I'm not asking for a big fact memo or chronology. I just want to know, is there a single document that says what I want it to say? So file read again, you can use it to ask broad questions, summarize, create a chronology, but also in this corpus of 100,000 or millions of documents, is there any document? And obviously I cherry picked it and yes, not all, uh, it turns out there's a document. We happen to know there are issues of spoliation in this case. It made the news, so I cherry-picked it. But the key takeaway here is we see customers using the tool for quickly getting up to speed with broad summaries, broad chronologies, but also trying to find hot docs right away or issues that are going to come up possibly later in the case, like spoliation or incriminating documents. We can get them right away with specific questions. That was going to be my next question about the contradiction, whether you can ask about contradictions. So there you go. You're anticipating my questions. Yeah, you can ask about contradictions. In fact, we just had a customer and 
this has happened multiple times, but this just happened. We had a customer use it at arbitration. So one use case for the tool is to use it live. If you have a case with a voluminous document record, you've got an associate using file read while someone is on the witness stand giving testimony, you can ask file read, is there a document that contradicts this? Is there a document that supports this? And file read's going to find you that document across the entire record and let you know if there's a document that's useful for impeachment purposes. So but we find that's been been a useful use case for the tool so far. And is it generally is the speed generally fast enough that you're able to do that pretty much in real time if you needed to do that? Yes, the first question you ask every day takes about 5 minutes and then after that I have clocked it to about 2 minutes and 10 seconds on average. So I actually did ask a bunch of questions um timed each of them and timed them and I got 2 minutes 10 seconds. It's not instantaneous, but it's fast enough that you can utilize it during um uh, testimony at trial. First answer of the day usually takes 10 minutes or so. <laughs> that's right. So it hasn't had its coffee yet. Maybe that's the issue. The last thing I want to talk about uh, are hallucinations and how we handle those. So I've mentioned the citations. That is something we built. That's our citations engine. We force each answer answer to cite to a document. What happens under the hood before you get to see an answer to a question is a sentence is going to be deleted or revised if the tool can't find support for that sentence in the document. So we are utilizing a large language model to draft the memo, but then our citations engine is forcing that memo to show its work. What that means is not just that you're not seeing hallucinations, but you can ask the tool about things that aren't in the production, and it will tell you, yes, they're not there. So I like to use this example. I cherry picked it because I happen to know that there aren't a lot of financial information in the documents we selected, but I said, create a fact memo about the amount of opioids sold by state by year, knowing that's not in there. And the tool comes back and says, none of the provided documents include specific quantitative data about that. Now, because I asked for a fact memo, the tool still goes through and it tries to find whatever information it can. But the key here is that it ultimately concludes the provided documents do not contain the requested metric. So it, it will absolutely tell you when the information's not there. And so this becomes useful not just to give our customers comfort that it's not hallucinating, but for things like, did the opposing side produce everything they said they would? So instead of going through a document dump of a million documents, trying to figure out, did they really produce what they said they would? We can just quickly go through their discovery responses, ask these questions, and know, okay, they didn't produce financial information for these years, or they didn't actually produce what they said they would. Any questions? there about well just in general i mean it seems to me that um it seems to me this is really useful early case assessment maybe during discovery trial prep depot prep i mean kind of across that whole discovery litigation life cycle is that is that right i mean is that is that, is that how you see people using it well we obviously pitch it that way i should say yeah, yeah you're, you're doing a better job selling it today than i am bob so it's like I mentioned, we've seen it used at trial. It's obviously huge during discovery. Both first level review is going to be the biggest inflection point. We've also seen people use it to help draft responses to discovery. You get served a bunch of interrogatories. You can use it on your own production to draft answers quickly. But the early case assessment one is huge, and that actually is what drives our desire to release the platform I mentioned, which is coming out in a couple of weeks, because we've had tremendous interest from corporate in utilizing the standalone platform for early case assessment. So I don't know if this will go in the 15-minute uh, demo, but just to answer your question, before it gets into relativity, before they incur the cost of collecting it, first-level review, I've talked to a, a number of in-house departments that want to use our tool to say, okay, this is an employment discrimination case. Was there a discriminatory email sent? Like, just tell us if we should settle this case right away. And so that's that's going to be a very big use case for the platform. You could obviously use Relativity for it now, but it requires getting the documents into Relativity. So we're really excited about the platform just making it really easy to do that early case assessment right off the bat. All right, thanks. Well, was there anything else you wanted to demonstrate today, Justin? No, that does it for today. Thank you, Bob. All right, well, thanks for showing us all about file read. It looks it looks really good and Relativity users, check it out. Others, uh, hang on for a couple of weeks, I guess, and you'll be able to use it as well.
Well, that does it for today's episode of How It Works. You can find the full series at directory.lawnext.com under our resources tab or on YouTube. Just search for How It Works there. Thanks for joining us today. This is Bob Ambrogi. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.